Hello everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Digital Mittelstand. My name is Jan and I help small and medium businesses to overcome their digital transformation challenges. I am the founder of 360 Digital Transformation and today I have Dan Burns as a guest. He is the founder of Testify, which has been established in 2017. And right now they have more than 30 employees, which makes them also a Mittelstand. But he is coming from New Zealand and he established the company in Munich. So uh, his story is definitely amazing. Today, we will talk about value stream mapping and software test automation. Without any further ado. Hello then, welcome. Hey, hey John. Hi. Hi. Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Daniel Burns. I'm the, the founder and CEO of Testify. Um, I'm originally from New Zealand, hence the, the, jade, uh, the jade pendant. I'm based in Germany. I've been here since 2007 and um, I've been working on Testify since, uh, with Testify since 2017. Um, and we're all about um, automation, integration and optimization of uh, the software de delivery processes. Yeah, thank you. But uh, you established Testify in Germany in 2017 and right now you are... 30 people approximately? Yeah, we're around 30 people. So uh, the company's grown pretty fast. Uh, we've more, more or less bootstrapped the growth on the base of uh, some large uh, customers. So we've got, um, well, BMW, Vodafone, Amazon, and uh, Nokia are um, our current customers. We have a number of smaller companies as well, but we're basically making a play with the bigger companies. Um, the goal is basically to look to try and optimize um, the way that software gets delivered within a big organization. So let's say this digital transformation, but really down in the engine room, looking at how software, uh, the, the whole software process can be optimi optimized by automating the testing, automating the build and deployment, linking it all together and creating a, a, an easier way to deliver software. So if we can take away all of that clutter, then we can allow the teams to focus on, you know, adding the value and uh, creating new features and so forth. And this is really the heart of what we do. And what we recognize then is it's not really about the automation, and the integration and all the technical parts. What it's really about is enabling collaboration, you know, making sure that the teams interact properly together and that we have this proper dialogue going through. And most importantly, most important of all is to make sure that we can link all of the change that's going on to the business value that's being realized or that should be realized within the organization. Yeah, I think it's a great point because you start with something, which is test automation, but then you realize unless you... Uh, tied up to a business uh, value, then uh, more or less it's uh, still have huge way to go. And actually, this brings me to my first question, because I know you are talking about the value stream mapping and you are quite passionate about the topic and creating business value. But can you please explain us what is value stream mapping and building upon that, how Mittelstand can benefit from that? Sure. Well, value stream mapping is basically understanding how value is generated or where, where the value in your business comes from. So how does your company generate value as a company to your customers um, and to the, the broader ecosystem? So it's understanding the flow across the organization from a systems perspective. And there's a fantastic picture of these guys, a uh, comic or cartoon of these people examining an, an elephant, you know? Everyone's so focused on their own part of the system, they sometimes lose sight of the big picture, right? And the big picture is there's an elephant there and that elephant needs to be fed. And, you know, the problem is because everyone's um, more or less you know, dedicated and focused and specialized in one part of this. Sometimes or very often you lose track of how this all fits together. And what that leads to is, is things like silos and, uh, you know, handovers between different departments and so forth. And this, of course, leads to wastage. And uh, here, of course, there's a lot of potential for, for improvement. And in the end, the reason I like this so much is it gives you a better understanding of the big picture in the organization, you know, um, how the different parts of the system work together and therefore how we can start to improve or offer value. And the important thing to remember about the value stream mapping is that it should be customer centric and focused on the customer. We should work backwards within the organization. I mean, I often experience this and, and this is typical for people that are you know, very technically and very focused on their areas is that it's not about the business and the product and the solution that you're offering. It's about the value that you can bring to the customer. And if you can provide value to the customer, you in turn give value back to your business 
by creating a viable business use case. And frankly, this is something that every organization can ben benefit from. Even if you're a one person freelancer through to the middle stand, all the way up to the enterprise applications. You know, this is, this is a top down way of looking at what it is that you're actually doing and how the processes evolve and how it all fits together and, and so forth. Yeah, and, and the reality is, is that this business flow is to a large extent impacted by the complexity of the organization. So if you have a simple organization, if you have a lean organization, then your processes tend to be lean and simple. If you have a complicated organization, then your processes tend to be complicated. And this is uh, actually known as Conway's law, uh, interestingly enough, right? So the, the complexity of your processes reflect the complexity of the organization. So the point therefore is, if you take a look at this big from a big picture perspective, you know, maybe this gives you some clues or some hints or some ideas about how you can optimize the whole process to remove some of that complexity and remove Move some of that friction. And like I say, this is something that every organization can learn from, you know, regardless of the size or, or the maturity. Yeah. So this is great to emphasize or highlight that uh, value stream mapping is for uh, companies from all size, regardless of freelancer or Mittelstand or enterprise. So that by thinking from the customer, and going back by following the value, therefore optimizing your processes and workflow, you can uh, bring more value to the customer. In turn, you bring value to your business. So that's my understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess the main point is that you can understand where the real drivers are, where are the real dials that you can turn. So by improving one area, how can you improve the value that you offer? Or how can you minimize the costs and the friction? In the organization. So there are two things. How can you increase your benefit and how can you reduce your costs or, or your or your pain points, let's say. Yeah. And um, generally speaking, I think this is a, a very healthy and a very important way to look at look at your organization. It, it does require a little bit of a different way of thinking because you've got to embrace a system system kind of wide thinking. And it thinks, um, and again, that depends on the size of the organization, right? That could involve, you know bringing together multiple assets or, you know, multiple parts of the system or thinking from that different perspective. And then you've got to understand, you know, the perspective of each of those different silos, you know, why is it like that, you know, and, and what can be done to improve this. But generally speaking, um, this goes very much hand in hand with this whole digitalization trend that we're going on. And I know this is your topic, of course, um, but with the digitalization, it's not just around uh, tools. It's also around the processes and the mindset that needs to happen in order to, to make that happen. And um, yeah, I mean, my favorite and most relevant story or, or anecdote around this is that basically this is a trend which is affecting all industries. And if you look at the automotive industry in particular, 50% um, of the costs of a new car these days is based around software, right? What that means, therefore, is that a car manufacturers and indeed any um, old industry enterprise, they're now first a software house and second a manufacturer, right? Which means that they have to embrace um, all the changes um, and, and then the new ways of doing things in order to support this kind of more lean and uh, slimmed down um, value process and value streams. And this, of course, demands change. It demands a new way of doing things. And, and any kind of change is always hard, right? Ch change is hard. And most people push back on change, not because of the value or the impact of the change. They push back on how it affects them personally, right? You've got to remember, in the end of the day, we're dealing with people. You know? So even if we have this system-wide perspective, we've still got to bring it down to the people and think about how we can influence or how we can make sure we support them to, to make their lives better or to be part of the solution and not part of the past, right? So Exactly, exactly. And there is a misperception that the complex, the better. I see that vice versa, the complex, the worse, because... As you said, uh, it also reflects to the complexity of the organization. So then it's difficult for you to pivot in case shit hits the fan, as you said, once uh, like times like in Corona. And we, we have all seen that. But can you please give us some use cases uh, for uh, value stream mapping when applied to the Mittelstand? Um, well, I mean, you can kind of think of it in any case. For example, if you imagine, um, let's say, where we have uh, an industry which typically is pure manufacturing, right? And now we've got the situation where we've got to think about how we can best serve our customers, right? So that means we've got to make sure from an after sales perspective or from, uh, um, we've, we've got to think about how we can um, offer our products 
in a, in a more um, agile way. Um, sorry, the example that I want to give is if we think about e-commerce, you know, we're now dealing with a flat world, right? Especially given that we've now got all the changes with Corona and so forth, there's much more of an emphasis on e-commerce or remote uh, purchasing and so forth. So that, you know, the need for shops and so forth uh, is, is decreasing. Right now, everyone does everything online, basically. So therefore, if you don't have an, an, uh, an e-commerce presence, you know, this has a huge uh, impact on your bottom line. So that means now you've got to embrace uh, th those digital channels. You've got to think about how you can reach your customers uh, e more easily. You've got to think about how you can connect with your customers, how you can create a loyal fan base without having that daily interact, you know, without having that face-to-face -face or that contact that maybe was a key part of your business model previously. So when you think about this, you know, you've got to think about, okay, who are my customers now and how do I reach them? And again, now we've got a distributed audience where previously we had localized people coming to the shop, you know, coming, speaking to the experts in the shop. Now we've got to think about, okay, we're now competing with companies worldwide, right? Just because uh, it's uh, around the corner is no longer a value add, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got to think about how can you appeal to this person and therefore understand um, understand their needs and their requirements, which means you've got to think more carefully, who are you speaking to? And then you've got to think about how are you placing the information, the marketing material, and, and how are you attracting or speaking to these customers, right? And um, yeah, we've also got to think about the feedback loops that come with this as well, because now we've got a different type of feedback mechanism. So instead of having that face-to-face -face contact, we've now got uh, you know this anonymized contact with people who are on the internet, right? And we've got to think about how can we understand and and greet and meet and work with customers who we don't have that same contact with. Um, and what this for me means then is there's multiple KPIs that we should be thinking about. So we should be thinking from a business level, okay? What's the number of uh, what's the number of calls? What's the number of sales? What's the number of whatever it is that we do? You know, what are the basic business units? You know, how often? How many are we getting? How long does it take to serve them? Um, you know, where are the bottlenecks? Where are the problems? Then underneath this, we have a business layer or a, a system layer, a component layer, where we think about okay, what are all the applications that we have to support those business value streams or those mm -hmm. business elements. How do they work? Are they uh, in-house software that we built ourselves? Is it an off-the-shelf third-party application? Is it some kind of cloud application? You know, how is that working? And um, how is, uh, you know, how long does it take to go through each segment? You know, is the optimization potential there? Can we streamline those processes? And then finally, underneath this, we have a um, let's call it the, the the development layer, where we think about how we iterate around. Because in a digital world with digital products, you know, we've got a much more fluid uh, environment where things are changing constantly you know so we've got to think about what's the health of our um of our change processes you know how long does it take to d implement a new change you know is there uh, or what happens when there's a problem how long does it take to get back up again um etc cetera, etc cetera. and so this gives you multiple layers of of kpis which therefore help the business now there is no hard and fast rule for what those kpis are everything depends a little bit on everything that the company's doing. There's no such thing as a one size fits all um, approach. On the other hand, there's a lot of things which really make sense. You know, there's a lot of things that help, you know, and one of the things that help is having a bias towards automation and a bias towards optimizing your systems by integrating things together. Obviously, this is a little bit our story, but um, what we generally say is that if, if something need, is repeated and if something has a high value, there's a high value in automating that process and removing any kind of uh, variabilities and, and so forth. So a big part of this could be testing, but it's not just the tests. It's also looking at processes and workflows and, you know, using tools like RPA or, or test tools or whatever it is in order to um, streamline or improve the process. Yeah. And this is a process that can start immediately, right? So there's always room for improvement or there's always elements which can you can immediately start to, to look at, you know, once you've got an understanding of that business value stream, you know, because then we can start to see where the where the um, where the silos are, where the handoff points are, where the where the friction is in the whole process. And if we have that big picture view, then we can start to drill down into the individual components, right? Into the individual systems, into the mini value streams that each component has. So we have an overall value stream, and then for each component, we might have a totally different way of delivering software there, for example, or we might have a totally different way of handling the customers inside each each um, each team. And by having then a big picture view, 
we can start to say, okay, which of these teams, which of these units are doing well, are you know, are high performing or high achieving, and which of the ones are, are not, or where do we see that there's problems? And then we can start to ask ourselves the question, why? Do we have those problems? You know, what's the reason? You know, and then we can start to think about optimization potential, such as automation and integrating these processes. But more importantly, um, it's about understanding how we collaborate across these points. Because one of the biggest uh, wastage points is when two teams connect, or where there's a handover point. You know, and the information is just not quite right. So these are all areas that um, that can be immediately looked at, and and you can start with this immediately. You know, once you have, uh, I mean, everyone has an idea about their use cases and the workflows and so forth, right? That's my takeaway. And I will definitely highlight that you can start immediately, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Start immediately. And yep. that's, again, um, suits me a lot while bias to action. So you can just start doing it and then it's better instead of contemplating where should we start and uh, you mentioned a good example uh, in the beginning, people examining an elephant, but they are losing focus of the big picture. But once you have the picture, the big picture, then you can drill down to the leg, drill down to the trunk, deal uh, down to the tail maybe and optimize there. But unless you have a, a profound understanding of the big picture, so it's an elephant and what does elephants eat? How do they sleep or where do they live then if you if you are doing then micro stuff which won't uh, necessarily help you uh, in a in the most effective way but as you said right now testify is more than 30 people uh, which makes you a mittelstand uh, definitely although you are a software company but <laughs> i would like to ask you the benefits of digitalization in testify you see in, in your company sure in, in our company right well um you know, with a bias towards automation, and a, um, it's not just about um, having these processes and having these tests and so forth. It's, it's what you can then do with that, right? So typical paradigm that we see with our customers and that we experience ourselves is that you go, you have to change mindsets to really enable or to use all this power. So you've got to go from a manual mindset to an automated mindset to an automate first mindset, right? So the automate first mindset means um, in the case of software delivery, which is in the end what we do, um, rather than automating the tests after the deliver delivery or development is finished, we automate the tests first, right? This means that our tests move or change from being um, a verification to being a living documentation that explains exactly what that feature does. Those tests will, of course, fail because the development or the piece of work hasn't been implemented. But as the implement increment, uh, the development is incrementally delivered, those tests will start to run red, uh, so initially run red, and they will start to run green. And then the rule is very simple. A test runs green until it runs red, uh, and then if it runs, and then it always runs green. So a test runs red until it runs green i.e. it passes. And then once it runs green, it always runs green. And if not, somebody has work to do, right? It, because it, it gives a feedback mechanism that we can immediately respond to. And generally speaking, creating these feedback loops is a super powerful way to, uh, to, 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 to create a net of psychological safety in the team. Because if you know when you're developing something, and if you break something by accident, which let's face it, this happens all the time in software delivery, you're going to get an immediate notification that something's been broken. This allows you to be much more creative with how you come up with your solutions. You know, you're much more able or much more likely to be able to uh, try different things out, you know, because you know that there's this, this safety mechanism sitting behind you, which has got your back, so to yeah. say. And uh, this is an incredibly powerful tool, right? And it also means that it makes it a lot easier for, for, for people to collaborate when you've got multiple people working on a code base at the same time. Sometimes very difficult to keep that organized and keep that coherent. Right. And so this kind of feedback mechanism and, and safety net encourages people to be more innovative and more creative. And the final point on this then is that, um, you know, very often in the case of uh, testing, you know, there's thousands or hundreds or many, many tests to get through, right? And so this leads to a kind of quantitative mindset, you know, and if you're doing this from a manual perspective, you've just got to crunch through those numbers. Like maybe you have to do 10 or 20 tests a day in order to get through them all. And if you're all you're doing every day is just running through these manual scenarios, you don't have time to offer more value to the organization. Yeah. If those tests have been automated, right? So you can handle, you know, the automation allows you, um, which costs more effort and time and energy at the start. But then every single time you execute those test cases, you get the benefit from them, you know? Now the, the quantitative crunching through all of those test cases is gone. 
Now you can offer a much higher value qualitative uh, feedback. You know, you can offer uh, your domain expertise and your business knowledge in a way that has much higher value than if you were just crunching through uh, predefined test cases, right? And this thing gives you, you know, much higher value or contribution to the company. And of course, it makes your life, your day-to-day -day biz work becomes much more fun and much more interesting because you have much higher uh, level of engagement, right? And this is then the main point when we talk to our customers is that what we've got to make sure as we go through this automation and integration and digitalization processes that we don't leave people behind, you know? Um, so these days when we talk about what we do, we don't talk about test automation, although that's obviously what we do. Um, what we talk about is creating a, a collaboration framework where we can bring those people who have less technical skill sets, maybe, yeah. which is um, perhaps the testers or the business analysts and so forth, and bring them into the game, so to say, so that they can contribute in a meaningful way. And that their value that they can bring as a domain expert or a business expert can be multiplied by the system. And therefore, they become part of the future rather than them being part of the past. And when I think about a successful digitalization exercise, this is one of the key messages, you know, is that we've got to make sure that the stakeholders involved become owners of the future, right? They become orientated towards the, the end solution where we're trying to get to. And again, this is the reason why tying and, you know, closing this big loop is why value stream mapping is so valuable, because then we can see how everything gets brought back into this kind of with a justification, why are we doing this? Why are we making these changes? We're making these changes because it adds value to the company, right? And now you can have a much higher value to, to that and you, you be, become part of or an, uh, to own that future solution, right? And that's again, the reason why we've got to have this top-down perspective, which we map we might, together with that bottom-up perspective too. Yeah. And then we have a, a closed system and, and, and uh, yeah. And that's basically the message, should I say, for what I've seen to be uh, successful transformations and changes that go on. Yeah, very, very well explained. Uh, very well explained. But as you mentioned a lot about test automation, I would like to ask you because it's a, a preconception that test automation is for big enterprises. And you also mentioned quite a big couple of clients in the beginning of our talk. But I still wanted to ask, is it applicable to Mittelstand as well? Absolutely. And, you know, as I came back to say before, you know, this is something that you can start immediately. So we also have smaller companies. Um, we also reach out on a regular basis to startups as well. And because, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a whole spectrum of technical capability that you have to deal with, right? But anyone that's dealing with software basically has to have a solution in place for this, right? And there are a couple of fundamental underlining principles that you should be moving towards, right? There should be a bias towards automation, continuous mm -hmm. integration, you know, using configuration management and, uh, you know, this, this, this DevOps infinity loop that we see, right? There should be more or less a bias in this direction. That doesn't mean it's an all or nothing thing. But if you've got a team of people, and what we typically see is that, um, you know, the development starts and it starts with some great ideas and you build some momentum and the testing kind of gets deprioritized. And then there's a manual testing team, which is then struggling to catch up and to, to keep forward with the pace of change. You know, in the typical or in the classic waterfall style, you have a design phase, a development phase, a testing phase, and then maybe at the end, there's some test automation. And that means then that the the testing at the end has lesser value. It's more expensive, and it you know it's it's error prone, right? And so the idea is is that we want to change that process so we put the tests at the start, you know, and start automating immediately. So this is the the manual mm -hmm. to automate to automate first shift or paradigm. And you know any company of any size can start with automating those processes from day one, like tomorrow, you know. And um, in order to facilitate this, what we've tried to do is we've tried to create a a, a system which democratizes testing, which means we've got to drag and drop. We've got to try and remove the barriers because if it's too yeah. technical and too complicated for someone who's not a programmer, for example, to use, right, then that creates a barrier for consumption. So the fundamental approach that we take is, is a building block approach, you know, with just drag and drop elements, which you can move across, you know, in order to enable people who are not super technical. Now, there's always a little bit of work at the front of any test automation exercise, setting up the framework, integrating it into the systems, creating those basic elements and so forth. Right. This is something that we obviously help our partners with or our customers with. And I tend to think of it more of a partnership rather than a customer uh, relationship by setting up that basic foundation. And then once we have that basic foundation, then what happens, 
if it's maintained or if it's set up in the right way is that after a little while, it starts to get easier and easier to create the test cases. And to give you a very concrete example, let's imagine um, you've got a website. In order to get onto that website and to, to access all the cool things, we first got to log in. So that means we've got to navigate to the website. We've got to enter the username, enter the password, click on login and check we've come to the right page. Right. And then after that, we can start to access all the cool functionality. Now we can take those basic elements and we can put that into a small building block, which is just login, you know, and now we can reuse that building block. And if you do it like this, with this kind of mentality that you're building up a library of elements that you can just plug and play and reuse, then it becomes super intuitive and really easy for people to use. And when I think about a typical software development process, typically you're not starting completely from scratch. Right, you're starting from an existing application and you're yeah. just incrementally changing something, you know? And those increments might be bigger or smaller, but it's still based around an existing system. So if we imagine that you've got, I don't know, 50 different use cases, by the time we've modeled 10 or 20 of them, we've already got kind of 80% of those elements already mapped, you know? And then if we do another one, it's just a slight variation to that, or it's just an extension of that, but we've already got the majority of the, the elements that we need ready to go, right? And this doesn't necessarily take a very long time to get set up and running. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, and then basically the, you can just roll with it, right? And, uh, and experience the benefits. Exactly. But that's why I love the low code approach to software development. That's what we also offer because you don't have to be a coder in order to build uh, apps or processes. So sure. as you said, and through the time you have all these blocks that say uh, maybe 20 processes you design or 20 test automation cases you design but 80 percent of the main building blocks for your test cases or for your processes are already there because they are quite repetitive so uh, then the majority of the work is done then it's for the next uh, couple of years you are eased by your workload to recreate the same things or reinvent the wheel because you have already done that. Thank you, Dan. But before we close, I will definitely ask you, what's your top suggestion for uh, Mikesh stand managers or owners to apply right away? Well, I mean, my suggestion is really is to, uh, to think about the value flow, the value stream in your organization. Take this big perspective, take the moment to step back and look at the elephant, you know, and understand where the value comes from your organization. And then at the same time, look at that and ask yourself the questions, okay, where are the friction points? Where are the things that are not working so well, right? Because once you've got that big picture, then it's possible to drill down. So that's the first piece of advice. And the second piece of advice is, is take action and try and start to improve those things, you know, and just focus not on proving solving the whole world immediately, solving the problems immediately, but just focusing on one particular area and looking to optimize that, you know, because once you've got a, a strong use case or a strong understanding of how the world could be, you know, you can start to roll that across the whole organization. And then if you've got this value stream concept, you know, then you have an, an ability to take those metrics and that information from that lowest level and just roll it up so that you've got a, a kind of a global perspective of your organization. And I can't emphasize or stress enough how powerful this perspective is in terms of uh, maintaining a, a control and an understanding of your application. And um, of course, I would be more than happy to have a conversation with anyone who wants to go deeper on these topics. Yeah. Uh, then it's a great point to ask how people can reach you or how people can find you. Sure. Well, our website is testify.io, which Sean will uh, post on the link as well. Um, I'm most active on uh, LinkedIn. Um, unfortunately, that's the only social media that I use, but um, I'm very happy to, to pass on my contact details and put them into the post. And uh, by all means, feel free to reach out to us. You know, and uh, At the very least, we're happy to have a conversation. And uh, if there's any other ways that we can help you, we'd also be very open to it, of course. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for this very informative talk. And as usual, I enjoyed it a lot and looking forward to talking to you soon. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it as well. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. <laughs> See you later. I release one episode every Tuesday at 7.45 a.m. and also other videos for digital transformation. If you like the content, please subscribe. And you can reach me out anytime by my email. Here it is. And thank you for visiting my channel.